Thank you very much for inviting us uh, to this meeting. Uh, and uh, we will be presenting uh, thoughts and data about uh, equitable and inequitable access to li living donor kidney transplant. In this presentation, we will focus on uh, the African Caribbean and Black community in Canada. Uh, but uh, as it will be apparent from the talk, uh, there are uh, similar inequities affecting other racialized communities as well. And um, some work is underway to explore those both within the action project that I will be mentioning briefly and outside from uh, different, um, in different projects. Um, Usually in, at, uh, during talks like this, there is a disclosure about financial uh, conflicts, potential financial conflicts. I think it, in this context, uh, the context of this talk, it's important to acknowledge that um, my, my positionality uh, obviously uh, makes me prone to certain types of biases. I'm a white middle-aged male physician, um, uh, originally from Hungary. Uh, I do hold a, a number of uh, privileges that are usually not acknowledged, and also my position as, a, as, a, as an academic nephrologist, a researcher, and a transplant nephrologist, uh, my bias, my, my thinking, my knowledge, my approaches in certain ways. And finally, uh, it's important to note that uh, the data analysis and the action project, uh, the qualitative research primarily that I will uh, be mentioning, is still in uh, uh, progress and uh, the statements and the conclusions are not uh, finalized yet. Uh, quickly, uh, thinking about uh, the inequitable access to transplantation, obviously when, when this topic comes up, frequently we like to look at, uh, at the US uh, where these uh, inequities have been documented um, for, for a long time and from different uh, aspects. Uh, this is a recent publication uh, that looks at the trends and to, to uh, understand whether these inequities changed during the time. Uh, this graph illustrates the, the, the span of the last 20, 25 years between 95 and 2015. And uh, what it shows that compared to white uh, recipients uh, indicated with this line up here, both black and uh, Asian recipients have much less chance uh, to receive a living neural kidney transplant in, in the US and this uh, inequity hasn't really changed. If anything, it might have gotten a bit worse or more pronounced during the last 20, 25 years. Of course, uh, increasingly it is appreciated that we don't necessarily need to go south of the border to experience inequities um, in access to health care. And um, this has been do documented for uh, a number of racialized uh, and ethnic groups in, in Canada as well. This graph just illustrates uh, the uh, documented uh, inequitable access to uh, transplantation for uh, indigenous peoples uh, compared to whites, so that, that is uh, the, this orange line, uh, both in old patients and in healthier younger patients, uh, compared to whites, uh, indigenous patients had much less chance to receive a, a transplant and an increased risk of uh, death in this analysis um, uh, from, from Canada. Uh, as I mentioned, other racialized communities have also been um, shown to have less access to transplant, kidney transplant and living donor kidney transplant. Um, we recently uh, confirmed these inequities uh, looking at our own data uh, base at the University Health Network. Um, and uh, this graph kind of summarizes uh, our findings and focuses on living donor transplant, living donor kidney transplant. And we also found and confirmed that compared to white patients uh, shown this, in this upper line, uh, both patients of South Asian, uh, East Asian and, and African Caribbean and black uh, background had uh, a, a quite uh, dr dramatically less chance, 50 to 70% less chance to receive a living donor organ, living donor kidney transplant. Um, and of course, as we stated in the title, uh, we are wondering about the reasons and potential solutions. Um, before uh, going to the research that we have been conducting, uh, I would like to ask Fadia Jerome Smith uh, to share uh, her experiences with us. And uh, just ask if uh, Fadia, you have sh slides or. Uh, 
I don't have slides, just my face. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for having me this morning. This is like a full circle. I used to attend the University of Ottawa a couple of years ago. Um, I wanted to share just a little bit of my experience, my story from, I guess, from the end to the beginning. So very quickly, I had my transplant in 2016 and I am a beneficiary of the paired exchange program. So my sister was able to give to a stranger and I received from a stranger. I can't remember how many people were in the chain, but this is um, how I ended up having my transplant and that everything is good and well. But to uh, you know, go back in, into time, um, my first symptoms started showing when I was in my undergrad um, in around 2006, 2005. And um, as a regular student on campus, I just felt, you know, fatigued and tired and stressed by, you know, just school. And um, so went to the campus clinic and there was just kind of, well, you know, you could just be really stressed. Um, so make sure you take it easy. And um, the following year, I go to the University of Ottawa to, to complete my teacher's college there. And um, in, I wanna say sometime in the winter, that's when stronger symptoms started showing up, but I had no idea what was going on. I was fairly active at that time, playing sports um, and whatnot. So I thought I just pulled a muscle in my back. I popped a couple Advils and went to sleep. I woke up with worse pain and there I was rushed to the hospital. So that's when I started feeling, okay, something is wrong, but I don't know and I don't understand what's going on. Um, I was then told that I had um, hypertension, that um, my kidneys were really small. Do I know why my kidneys were really small? The biggest medical issue that I had was asthma as a child. Um, so I did go to the hospital fairly often because of asthma attacks, but that's where my interaction with, you know, the healthcare system um, laid, nothing related to my kidneys, nothing related to um, hypertension or blood pressure issues. So still on campus, finished school, and they referred me to a nephrologist in my hometown. I see the nephrologist kind of tell him, you know, what was, you know, what were my symptoms, what I experienced and so on. And that's when I started noticing that, okay, maybe this is not, maybe it's not that big of a deal, right? I, I have small kidneys. I potentially have hypertension. Um, I'll be okay because that's the experience that I had with that doctor. They ran a few tests um, and I was sent home with some type of medication no real idea what I was taking for what reason to treat what specifically um, not really thinking that I had any real issues with my kidneys um, I did run tests for lupus I did run tests for um, HIV AIDS and I'm hearing all these words and I never really had time to digest what I was hearing or even understand what was happening with my body so my conclusion after that visit was that, well, I'll be okay, I'll be fine. And I didn't receive a call back, so I should be okay. Um, so this was in 2007, 2008. And fast forward to um, 2010, that's when everything just kind of fell apart. So in the span of four years, uh, my kidneys were just deteriorating and I had no clue. Um, Dr. Google is not <laughs> a reliable source. You know, uh, as a millennial, I was online searching, trying to figure out what was going on with my body um, and never really having any real conclusion. So my takeaway from that part of my experience was that um, that we need to have more education out there in the schools, in, um, in churches, wherever community is, our communities are gathering uh, when it comes to um, health that are outside, or I should say that go beyond the typical, um, you know, aches and pains. Um, I'm, I think I'm a fairly, you know, 
uh, uh, open person, open for conversation and ask questions. I felt like I had enough self-advocacy at the time, but the other, the last thing, and that's the worst part is that I didn't feel like I was taken seriously. And um, because I wasn't taken seriously, I just kind of, well, I must be fine because this person in authority is not really um, following up with me to make sure that I'm okay. It was in 2010 when my kidneys really took a hit that I met another nephrologist and it was also my OBGYN at the time. And there I was, okay, this is what's happening with your body. This is, uh, this is what GFR stands for. This is what um, your kidneys should be doing. All of that information I did not receive in 2007 and in 2008. Um, so overall, that's my experience. Um, you know, with at the beginning stages of, of my kidney, um, my chronic kidney issues. And um, if I were to give a solution um, is first and foremost to, to build that trust between the patient and the, the health professional, and also to give as much and provide as much education um, as possible, even though um, it may look like there may be other barriers. And if that's the case, then we need to rally up the community as a whole to make sure that um, the message is clear and that there is solidarity within, um, between the, the, the patient and the, the practitioner at, um, at the time. Thank you for having me again this morning. Thank you very much uh, for sharing uh, uh, your story, Fadia. And uh, I will talk briefly about the project that tries to look at um, some of the causes of potential inevitable to uh, living in transplant in the African Caribbean and Black communities, um, and to try to highlight some of the uh, points that Fadia made uh, during her uh, presentation. So this project is called the Action Project, which is improving access to living donor kidney transplant in uh, ethno-racial minority communities in Canada. Um, this, is, uh, st this has started in 2019, uh, funded by the Healthcare Policy Contribution Program. Uh, it is a two and a half year uh, project uh, that we do collaborate in collaboration with um, uh, colleagues Jack, Jack Birkill and, and his group in uh, British Columbia. They are uh, assessing the South Asian communities and their access to care. And uh, in, in Toronto, we are focusing on the African Caribbean and Black uh, communities in partnership with uh, professionals, patients uh, from uh, the ACD communities, and also with a number of community organizations, uh, primarily the Black Health Alliance. In this project, we want to engage patients and community members uh, to understand uh, these uh, experiences that uh, are potentially uh, causing in, in, in equitable access to care and, and living donor transplant. And we try to uh, uh, kind of collaborate on potential actions and solutions to improve access to transplant and uh, reduce these inequities. Uh, we are applying quantitative and qualitative approach. We try to uh, collect data from patients with kidney failure um, uh, that looks at attitudes and knowledge about kidney transplant. And also we have been conducting uh, focus groups and interviews both in the general community uh, with people who didn't have a specific experience with kidney disease and also patients with kidney failure and healthcare professionals from ACB communities. Uh, when we looked at, when we met with patients who have kidney failure and uh, they have been on dialysis or in, in advanced stages of kidney disease, um, when we asked whether they had a potential living donor in mind, uh, this doesn't mean that they had an actual living donor cleared, but uh, we saw the same differences that were demonstrated for transplant before compared to white patients, uh, both patients from ACB communities and uh, Asian patients, Asian Canadians, had uh, less, uh, 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 less uh, chance to have a living donor in mind. Uh, at the same time, when we asked patients whether they would accept a, a living donor offer if uh, someone offered a kidney, uh, there was no difference between uh, the different uh, communities. 
knowledge is an issue and it has been frequently cited as one of the potential reasons. So we, we looked at uh, transplantary knowledge using a standardized uh, score, uh, knowledge score, and we did see that uh, compared to white patients, the red bars here indicate high scores, uh, the blue uh, bars indicate low scores. Compared to white patients, uh, both patients uh, from ACV communities and Asian patients uh, seem to have um, somewhat less uh, transplant knowledge. At the same time, when we asked fundamental questions about whether uh, they knew that transplant was uh, uh, associated with better survival and quality of life and some other fundamental basic information about transplant, there was again not, uh, not really significant difference between the groups. Uh, where we saw a significant difference, uh, at least one of the uh, area uh, relates to communication. Uh, patients uh, from uh, ACB communities, Asian Can Canadians, were much less likely to share information about their condition or share uh, information about transplant with uh, family or uh, friends or community. So uh, there's so much you can learn from numbers and qualitative research bring, uh, brings very important uh, understanding about uh, biomedical issues as well. So we uh, decided to use a mixed methods and, and we did uh, focus groups and interviews. Uh, in the analysis part, we uh, also brought about uh, the critical race uh, theory and the critical race analytic framework. The whole project wasn't conceived uh, within this framework, but in the analysis uh, with the help of Rhonda George, who is a sociologist um, and has um, a, a deep understanding of the critical race theory, we uh, applied these approaches um, to, to our qualitative data that we collected from community and from patients. The emerging themes that uh, point to uh, potential reasons and hopefully potential solutions uh, around uh, uh, inequitable access are a medical mistrust that is, is quite strong and strongly expressed primarily in community focus groups. Uh, there are several culture and health beliefs. Uh, there is a very strong feeling, perception of stigma of illness and specifically stigma of kidney disease. That might be one of the reasons why um, uh, patients are not uh, willing to communicate about uh, this with, with even with uh, more uh, distant family members. And importantly, uh, there's a lack of AC uh, representation of, of uh, black professionals in the healthcare system. And that um, uh, kind of reinforces feelings that the system may not be designed for these communities. Uh, uh, and uh, repeatedly we heard that there is a, a strong need for information for education about kidney disease from credible sources um, and also presented in a holistic, more person-centered, patient-centered way than it is currently being experienced. Very quickly, uh, uh, referring to the pr process of racialization, which uh, uh, seems to contribute significantly to, to these inequitable accesses that we see in healthcare in Canada as well. Uh, and just a reminder that uh, racialization is a social process uh, whereby certain groups are negatively defined and uh, 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 considered as, as inferior for various reasons. And within this process, it is important to emphasize the specific uh, characteristics and details of anti-Black racism uh, when we talk about uh, ACB communities. Um, this process creates and, and recreates negative experiences um, in the healthcare system and other social institutions. And that will lead to this um, uh, heightened uh, uh, vigilance and self-awareness as black and the need for uh, stronger self-efficacy. Uh, we certainly have a universally accessible healthcare system that um, has a, a lot of benefits. Uh, it is important to understand though that uh, this is not necessarily uh, equally accessible um, uh, for uh, people for, who are coming from ACB communities uh, due to the reasons that are listed here, at least uh, some of the reasons uh, lay behind in these both um, personal negative experiences and historic uh, um, uh, uh, knowledge about uh, past experiences of the community with healthcare system. Just to illustrate these points, um, 
about the ethnic identity and how uh, ethnicity and race may, may uh, shape the healthcare experiences and access to healthcare. Uh, this quote says that it's not really how we identify ourselves, said one of our community member participant, but what affects it, uh, our care is how people see us. And it is uh, referring to the racialization and uh, racist um, uh, attitudes of the external society. Uh, the, the experiences were uh, recurrent theme in, in the focus groups. Uh, one quote uh, was talking about uh, the slavery experience of the community and the experimentation of black uh, men and women. Um, and as a result, as um, it has been stated already, there is this perceived need to advocate a little bit harder, push a little bit more to receive the same level of care as, as white uh, patients uh, perhaps uh, uh, receive. So uh, as mentioned, information is much needed, uh, but uh, certainly uh, credible uh, sources are uh, important. Uh, people with lived experience of the condition, people who resemble the community, and uh, the role of respect and uh, patient-centeredness is emphasized uh, throughout. Um, so com uh, coming from these uh, uh, discussions, interviews, and, and focus groups, um, uh, the ways on a higher level to improve equitable access is first and foremost, we need to acknowledge uh, that uh, these issues are um, present in our healthcare system, systemic racism is present in the healthcare system, and that is part of the problem. We do need data, uh, and there is currently no race-based data collection in healthcare in Canada, except as, as few pockets as we uh, recently heard. And we do need a number of systemic changes uh, to address these issues and the important the representation of black professionals throughout. In our project, we try to pilot an approach where we uh, uh, create a, a community supported, peer supported, um, culturally safe environment for kidney uh, health discussions, both uh, for the early uh, changes, early stages of chronic kidney disease and for more advanced kidney failure in partnership with the regional kidney programs in the province and uh, the highly specialized transplant centers. And at least some of this information will be provided in community health centers uh, where um, the representation of community uh, can be ensured. And uh, uh, finally, I just wanted to acknowledge our funders um, uh, and also our uh, community partners who help us uh, along this way. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for your presentations. Um, next up, we have Professor um, Megan Taze, um, who is a lecturer at Adelaide Law School in Australia. And she will be speaking on media representations of public solicitation for organ donors. Thanks very much. Sorry, just give me one second. There we go. Okay. Um, I'm going to be speaking about media coverage of public solicitation. Essentially, public solicitation refers to a patient in need of a transplant or their representative making a request to members of the public to donate an organ. Oftentimes, this involves someone asking a member of the public to be a living kidney donor or perhaps a living liver donor. Public so solicitations can be made in any number of ways. There have been instances of people taking out billboards advertising their need for an organ, uh, taking out ads in the newspaper, walking around Disneyland, wearing a t-shirt, um, uh, telling people that you need uh, a kidney. There have been a whole wide number of social media type uh, pleas for organ donors, such as on YouTube, Facebook, there's uh, an actual website that has been created called matchingdonors.com, 
where people who are in need of a transplant can actually create a Facebook-like profile. Um, and then if you are interested in donating to someone, you can kind of flip through these different profiles and try and find someone you think is worthy of your kidney. Um, and most recently, I found just today uh, that public solicitation has now come to TikTok as, as well. So essentially, public solicitation can be made through any means by which information can be disseminated to the world. I'm going to focus on two high profile public solicitations that happened in Canada in 2015. Although these cases are a few years old now, I think they still hold some valuable insight into how these requests can be made, how they are portrayed, and I think their juxtaposition really illustrates why public solicitation can be such a contentious issue. And by looking at these cases, what we'll see is that both the benefits and concerns associated with this practice. So many of you might be familiar with these cases. On the left here, we have the Wagner twins, and on the right, we have Eugene Melnick. For those who might not be familiar with these people or these cases, I'll go through a brief factual background of these cases now. So in January of 2015, the Wagner family set up a Facebook page indicating that they needed a liver for their three-year-old daughter, Bin. Bin and her twin sister were adopted from Vietnam by the Wagners, and both twins had a rare genetic condition, rendering each of them in need of a life-saving liver transplant. Their adopted father was able to donate part of his liver to one of the twins, but that meant that the other twin needed a liver donor or a liver from someone else. Their story ended up getting picked up in local newspaper coverage, and this then expanded um, in scope and the story became uh, national. And as a result of this story, hundreds of people inquired about donating their liver to Bin. And in April, an anonymous donor responded to this plea and donated part of his liver to Bin. One month later, a press conference was held on behalf of Eugene Melnick. Eugene Melnick is the owner of the Ottawa Senators NHL hockey team. He is a very wealthy and well-known figure in Canada. In the press conference, Melnick's need for a life-saving liver transplant was made clear, and the public was asked to donate. Given his public profile, this press conference itself immediately generated a lot of media attention. And one week later, he received a transplant from an anonymous donor. In the wake of Melnick's transplant, there were some critical headlines that emerged asking whether he was able to essentially jump the queue for an organ as a result of his wealth and public profile. And there seemed to be a difference in tone in terms of how his story was being covered versus the Wagners only a month prior. So this prompted my colleagues and I to conduct a study where we actually analyzed and compared the newspaper coverage of the Wagners versus the newspaper coverage of Melnick. This we thought was a really unique and interesting situation where we had these high profile solicitations occurring so close together in time, and yet they seemed on their face to elicit different responses in terms of how they were being portrayed. So we collected 155 newspaper articles from a two year period starting from when the Wagner story was first covered. Of these articles, Melnick was mentioned in 111 and the Wagners in 59. So we can see the coverage of Melnick was a little bit more significant um, than that of the Wagners. Essentially, the two stories were framed in different ways. The story about the Wagners was very much framed as a human interest story about a noble family struggling with a health issue where the only solution was a transplant that they simply could not provide. The fact that this family had nine kids, four of which were adopted from Vietnam, orphanages um, came up in the story. 
the fact that the father in this family was in the military, he had served on three tours of Afghanistan, this was information that was raised in these stories, the fact that only one of the twins could receive a liver from the father was portrayed by the, a lot of the newspaper coverage here in almost like a Sophie's Choice kind of manner. Um, essentially, this story had all the right elements to tug on people's heartstrings. The story about Melnick, on the other hand, was a story about a wealthy man employing this contentious act of public solicitation to save his life. The fact that he was a billionaire was raised in many of the stories about him. And this is not to say that the coverage about him was mostly negative, as I'll uh, get to in a moment. Actually, most of it was quite positive. But the act of his solicitation, the actual press conference that was called to make this plea to the Canadian public, that was front and center in the stories about him which attracted discussion of different issues than the Wagner's. Because the Wagner story was framed the way it was as more of a human interest type piece, their actual request for a donor on their Facebook page was not even mentioned in 52% of the articles that were focused on them. So the issue of public solicitation itself did not feature very prominently in those articles. With Melnick, on the other hand, the press conference that was held itself, that was a newsworthy event in and of itself, and that was raised in almost all of the articles about him. And as a result of this, we can see that there is a difference in terms of whether the articles discussed any ethical issues or concerns regarding their respective requests. In the articles that were focused primarily on the Wagners, there were no ethical issues or concerns raised regarding their request for public solicitation more broadly. In the group of articles that were not primarily focused on the Wagners, but where the Wagners were nevertheless mentioned in the article in some capacity, there were ethical concerns raised specifically with respect to the Wagner's request for a donor, um, and the, in, in only four articles though, and the concern was essentially about fairness and whether it's fair that they should receive a transplant because of their heart-wrenching story. And this is sometimes referred to as a concern about this becoming a beauty contest, awarding an organ to uh, the cutest child or the people with the most heart-wrenching, compelling story. In the articles focused on Melnick, ethical concerns were raised in 40% of the articles. And the most common issue by far was again this focus on fairness and whether it was fair that he was able to use his public platform to obtain a transplant. In terms of the overall tone of the articles, 57% were positive towards both the Wagners and Melnick. 0% were negative or critical of the Wagners, whereas 13% had an overall negative or critical tone for Melnick and his solicitation. So there are a few implications from this study and from these pieces more broadly that I'll touch on now. So one of the concerns about public solicitation is that negative coverage or opinions about these requests might diminish public trust in organ donation and transplantation systems. Although the coverage of Melnick was generally positive or neutral, the fact that 13% of the articles were generally critical and that the ethical issue most prominently raised in the articles was one of fairness in using wealth to bypass traditional allocation policy, I think is nevertheless important to consider. It's beyond the scope of our study to look at whether the coverage had any actual impact on people's beliefs or perceptions about donation. But we do know from other studies that public portrayals can um, actually influence people's attitudes about donations and negative public portrayals in particular can have an impact. So this might be something worth keeping an eye on, not only in future media stories and studies, 
um, of, of media reporting, but also about public perceptions of these stories and what impact, if any, they're actually having. It was also interesting to note that the ethical concerns that were discussed or that tend to be discussed and debated amongst academics and organ donation and transplantation policy experts are not necessarily the same ethical concerns as those portrayed by the media. Other than the questions about fairness and queue jumping, the range of ethical issues that are normally associated with public solicitation in these other academic policy type circles didn't really arise very frequently in the newspaper coverage. Um, some of these concerns that often get raised with public solicitation are concerns about commercial exploitation, concerns about privacy, um, and concerns about the resources it takes to deal with high profile requests. But even though these last three concerns were largely absent from the newspaper coverage, we can see when we look at these cases more broadly that they actually do raise some of these concerns. With respect to privacy, the man who donated part of his liver to Bin Wagner did so anonymously, but his privacy was actually violated when someone disclosed his identity to Mrs. Wagner. Now the two of them ended up becoming friends and they've actually started this charity together. So things seem to have turned out well in this case, but things might not work out so nicely in all cases. And this certainly shows, I think, that the ability to maintain anonymity in such a high profile case might be difficult. In terms of the resources needed to deal with these cases, we can see that 600 potential donors responded to the Wagner's request and it was later reported that with respect to Melnick's request, 2,000 people um, called into the hospital, 560 filled out applications, 12 were assessed, one went on to donate, and this entire process happened within just seven days. So the amount of resources to make that happen would have been quite substantial. While it's again beyond the scope of our study to try and measure the actual policy impact of the media coverage that we looked at, I think it's probably fair to say that the media coverage prompted some policy discussion and also highlighted a lack of consistent national policy about public solicitation. A month after Melnick's transplant, another story broke about an eight month old girl who also needed a liver transplant. The parents followed a similar pattern of creating a Facebook page and trying to generate some media coverage. However, this family was being treated by a transplant program in Alberta, whereas the Wagners and Melnick were being treated in Ontario. And at that time, Alberta was not willing to proceed with anonymous living liver donations. And the refusal to allow baby Naomi's family to try to find her a donor in the exact same way that both Melnick and the Wagners had done just a month earlier created some media backlash. And shortly thereafter, the policy in Alberta changed. And again, I'm not saying that there was a direct causal impact between the media coverage and the policy change, and that's not what we studied in our study. But I think what we can say is that the media coverage highlighted an inconsistency between jurisdictions within Canada and raised different questions about fairness, where the inability to access public solicitation was portrayed, at least in some stories, as unfair. We can also see that shortly after this, a position paper was developed on behalf of the Canadian Society of Transplantation with input from members from uh, Canadian Blood Services and what was then the CNTRP. And that this position paper took an overall positive stance toward public solicitation. And while the media coverage certainly did not dictate the content of this paper, I think it's probably fair to say that these high profile cases that had happened in the year, year and a half previously, played a part in at least prompting this discussion to occur. And this is actually acknowledged in the paper itself. So there might be some lessons here for jurisdictions or programs without a policy already in place regarding public solicitation, as it might only take one or two high profile media cases to bring these issues very quickly and very squarely within public awareness. 
So there might be some benefit to having uh, proactively having some policies in place. Um, in the interest of time, I might skip through this slide, but I'm happy to take any questions uh, if anyone has any uh, questions about what I think our study shows about the role of the media um, in terms of actually um, uh, amplifying these uh, requests. But I think in terms of some concluding thoughts, um, I think the Melnick and Wagner cases really highlight some of the controversies and benefits of public solicitation. On the one hand, these cases show the potential for privacy violations, the need for large resources to handle um, high profile requests and responses from the public, and there are certainly concerns about fairness and queue jumping. On the other hand, on the point about fairness, there's really nothing inherently fair about living donation as a concept. Um, those with large networks of family and friends are going to be advantaged over those with smaller circles of loved ones and public solicitation could be seen as one method to kind of allow those with a smaller social circle to kind of expand their, their network in scope. Um, so whether concerns about fairness are necessarily compelling in terms of evaluating the merits of public solicitation is perhaps an open question. Um, although I think it's certainly worth remembering that this concern was raised quite prominently in the media coverage. Um, and it's therefore something I think to keep an eye on in terms of whether this is actually resonating with the public and impacting levels of public trust, which might be problematic. But at the end of the day, Bin Wagner and Eugene Melnick each got transplanted, thereby shortening the waitlist for others. These are actual human lives that were saved that otherwise might have been lost. And this, to me, is the most compelling benefit of public solicitation. Whether this outweighs some of the more controversial aspects is, I think, a matter that continues to be debated and discussed, and I don't think there's yet a uniformity of opinion. Um, but it's a practice that seems to be continuing, especially with the advent of social media, and one that would probably benefit from uh, further study. And that's all I have to say about this. Thank you very much. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Sarah. So thank you very much for your presentation. Um, now we're going to move to uh, our Q&A. Um, we have about 20 minutes or so for questions. Um, I would encourage everyone to um, type in your questions to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, um, and then I'll be posing them to our respective panelists. So I'll give you a moment to type in your questions. So I see I have one question here. Um, it says, with public solicitation of this type, was there a result in uptake in additional anonymous donors for others on the list? So this is a question for uh, Professor Taze. So that, that oftentimes is one of the benefits that sort of claimed with public solicitation that it increases awareness of um, that increases awareness of organ donation more broadly and can potentially lead to more donors. Of the, what was it, like 2,000 people that responded and uh, indicated an interest to donate to Mr. Melnick, I think only 15 of those um, indicated a willingness to donate to anyone else other than Eugene Melnick. And I don't think any of those were actually eligible and able to go on to donate. So as a result of that, I don't think any um, additional donations happened to the, to the best of my knowledge. Okay, I see our next question. Um, 
This is also a question for Professor Taze. One of the concerns about public solicitation was encouraging paid living donation. Is this something mentioned in the media at all? That was not something that came up a lot. There were a few references in the newspaper coverage to the fact that um, paying for donation is legally prohibited in Canada, but it wasn't really connected very prominently to public solicitation itself. But that is certainly one of the concerns that exists with public solicitation. It's something that's been documented on that matchingdonors.com website. Um, some uh, studies have been done looking at uh, that website and the types of communications um, that go on and they've shown that people actually do receive offers for payment um, in exchange for uh, an organ and that's not uncommon, I don't think. Um, so that's, yeah, very much a, a strong concern in this uh, issue. Okay, I see a few other questions that have now popped up. Um, the next question is for, um, uh, Dr. Muxi and also Ms. Uh, Jerome Smith. So the question is, the data you showed addressed in inequities in access for several communities, um, but Indigenous access wasn't mentioned. Do you happen to know if the same pattern applies? Thank you for the question. Uh, on my second slide, I, I, I did uh, show some data uh, from um, uh, that was done. The analysis was done in Alberta by Marcello Tonali and, and his group. And uh, repeatedly, in, uh, inequitable access to kidney transplant and living donor transplant has been documented in Canada for Indigenous people. So that is uh, a similar situation. In our study, we have not focused or have not included questions about Indigenous identity, and we did not work with Indigenous indigenous communities. Okay, so I have um, a couple other questions here. Um, one of the questions says, um, excellent presentation, thoughts about resources being provided to recipients in terms of coaching, um, et cetera, to engage in these platforms by the associated, uh, I think it's transplant program. I think this is a broader question. Well, uh, I, I guess before I, I add my two cents, I ask uh, Fadia, have you received any support or did you have any, what kind of support did you have? Uh, or what kind of resources could you access? Um, so at the, when I was diagnosed with um, chronic kidney um, disease, I did receive a, a booklet <laughs> with a lot of information um, that I kind of had to go through and um, a lot of YouTube and a lot of Googling, um, but it with like actual information, I think it was just this really big booklet talking about kidney disease in a general sense. Um, that's the extent of the information that I received at the time. Thank you. So there, there is uh, written and online information available for patients and uh, transplant programs and, and renal programs uh, frequently point this out. And also I, I, I need to add, and that, that's also for a policy consideration, that the, the resources, the nature of uh, providing information about transplant and living donor transplant is quite different uh, across the provinces. Uh, in Ontario, there is one provincial initiative now that uh, aims to improve access to knowledge around transplant. Uh, this is uh, uh, organized and, and run by um, the Ontario Renal Network and Trium Gift of Life. Uh, and within this program, there is an education component where uh, both uh, the renal, uh, the provincial renal programs receive enhanced education about kidney transplant. And also we try to uh, translate that into patient information, patient education. And within this provincial initiative, importantly, uh, there is a, a peer support, a patient uh, support uh, program called the Trans Transplant Ambassador Program. And I emphasize that because uh, from, from our focus group, we know that, uh, that certain members of the uh, ACB communities want uh, information from people with a lived experience. And that's much more credible and uh, much more easily accessible than a big booklet or even online uh, resources. And so pe peer support and uh, support from past donors, uh, recipients of, of uh, transplant is essential in, in engaging patients in thinking about kidney transplant. Okay, I now have a question for uh, Mr. Gross. 
So the question reads, it was interesting to hear that one of the kidney allocation systems in the US, um, I think the one measuring liquidity in transplant programs, um, uh, points were deducted if one of your patients was a difficult to match patient. That seems like a risky incentive to include. Would it encourage avoidance of difficult patients? Um, are there other incentive problems set up by some of these allocation systems? Mr. Gross, Judd, are you there? Thanks. I am. I think I was on mute. <laughs> Both in the United States and in Canada, transplant exists within a matrix of incentives, including prestige, financial reimbursement, and the gratitude that comes with giving someone a new lease on life. I haven't heard of any empirical evidence of such an effect when we're talking about patients who have already been listed by the program, but we do want to be mindful of the possibility of unintended consequences. Okay, so um, the next question is for- Can I, can I add something? <laughs> Sorry, I'm, sure. I'm Evelyn uh, Tenenbaum. I'm here from, uh, actually from the United States. So um, I just want to say that, it. go ahead, Jed. I said, great that you could join us. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to add that um, for reneging in uh, kidney chains, I know that in the US we have a screening process. So they actually screen um, individuals who are in a kidney chain to ensure that they, they I mean, you can't ensure that they don't renege, but to decrease the possibility of reneging. And actually there have been studies showing that very few people end up um, in a kidney chain refusing to donate who've been chosen. You look confused. Am I not answering the question? Okay. Um, okay, sorry. I just have a few things coming up on my screen. That's why you saw my face. <laughs> I apologize. Um, so this is an, the next question is for Dr. Muxi. Um, says, uh, in an ideal world, we want a huge increase in organ donations. Do you think the healthcare system is equipped to handle an increase in transplants? As of now, do you feel as though uh, transplant care teams are overwhelmed with the amount of patients they must care for? Uh, well, I, obviously this is uh, an important consideration and we don't want to flood uh, the healthcare system, but I also want to remind everybody that this is about saving lives. And uh, I think um, we will need to uh, try to provide the resources that are needed. Um, uh, many initiatives, both in the United States, in Europe, and, and in Canada, I mentioned the, uh, the Ontario initiative, but there are uh, other initiatives to improve uh, access to donation uh, in, throughout the different uh, jurisdictions. None of them have resulted in a doubling of access to transplant within five years. So uh, although we may want that um, or try to achieve that, but it, it it takes time to, to increase. Also, it's important to emphasize that um, what many of the initiatives want is really that patients will be informed properly. They have the time and the chance to explore all of the treatment options and they select what they think it's best for them. Uh, from a medical perspective, we think that for many patients, transplant and living donor transplant is the best, uh, but everybody will need to consider their own individual circumstances so that, that is another mitigating factor uh, that will uh, kind of slow down any change. Um, in terms of resources within the healthcare systems, uh, I think, of course, uh, we have uh, we are still in the middle of a pandemic that uh, that put uh, quite immense strains on the on the resources in the healthcare system. Uh, transplants have been slowed down in many jurisdictions, in many centers, including ours, and uh, we are just recovering. But I think uh, that um, we will need to be able to accommodate an increasing. Um, availability of donors, if that's the case uh, as a result of all the initiatives. And um, 
also we need to remember that uh, at least for kidney transplant, uh, the, the alternative is dialysis or for, for many patients, the alternative is dialysis, which also drains uh, immense resources from the system. In fact, uh, each and every transplant will save tens of thousands of dollars for uh, the, the healthcare system. So kind of saves resources at the end if um, uh, the balancing goes well. Okay, our next question is for, um, for Mr. Taze. What type of public solicitation has been most successful? Has anyone studied the relative outcomes of solicitation on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, billboards, alumni association, t-shirts, religious involvement, other solicitations? Um, is there a comprehensive guide for implementing these strategies? There's no comprehensive guide that I'm aware of. Um, I think one of the interesting things about public solicitation is that it seems to be increasing, but there's a lack of empirical data and studies out there on the phenomenon. I think that's increasing. People are starting to look at this in uh, a bit more detail, but I'm not sure that a study has actually been done sort of comparing the effectiveness of different strategies. I think the, the TikTok lady got transplanted. I think the Disneyland t-shirt guy got transplanted. Um, but I think that's certainly an area where there's uh, room for more research. Great. So um, our next question is for um, Mr. Ohm Smith, um, which is just asking about um, how you and your family experienced the living donor system. Um, how did that work for you? Um, the process was was pretty pretty um positive my experience was very positive um i had the opportunity to um to really ask all the questions that i had i did bring my husband at a time or my sister at a time um, to ask the questions that i didn't think of and they were all answered um at the time of the the, the meeting the challenge was really with my parents um, you know, they are from a Caribbean country and they had a lot of um, just mistrust with the, the system. So there was a lot of just kind of being in between to convince my parents, especially my mother, that, you know, my sister is in good, you know, um, good hands to, to go through this process. Um, you know, she had just given birth, baby was a year old, he was premature, so she had that you know, to kind of reconcile in her mind, like, you can't leave your baby and you're going to all the way to Alberta, what happens? And, you know, she had a lot of concerns and worries. So we, we had, my sister and I had to kind of be in the middle just to um, reassure my parents that they were okay. My dad wanted nothing to do with the hospital, um, just hated the whole process, hated to see me sick. And um, so emotionally, that's where the challenge was uh, with my family. But when it came to asking questions or just having clarification um, on anything that we had um, on our minds, my sister and I, um, everything was addressed um, at the time. Um, so the next question I have is, um, are there policies in place to protect chains within the paired program um, in the event that a chain is broken before completed? So a link does not go through. Um, and is this something that is being looked at for future changes in the paired program? Um, do you think the voucher system used in the, in the states addresses and offers a possible solution to this potential issue? Yeah, I think historically the focus was not so much on protecting chains as safeguarding donor recipient pairs. So by initiating a chain with an altruistic donor, the effect was that the recipients in the pairs would receive their transplant before the paired individual donates. What that meant is if for some reason the donation is not possible, the chain would just end, but you would not have a situation where there is a couplet where someone has donated, but their loved one has not received an organ. Uh, you're right that vouchers are actually a subset of a phenomenon called advanced donation. And if we think about advanced donation, um, more broadly, it does include situations where for one reason or another, a chain may break up or an individual may not be able to receive a transplant as part of the chain at their scheduled time. And it is somewhat analogous to the voucher system, the, may they, the way they may be bumped into a succeeding chain. 
So I think we have time for one more question. Um, this question uh, says, given the challenges and inequities of public solicitation, should we have a national platform that allows all patients to make public pleas and share their stories? An interesting idea. Um, one of the points that I didn't get to on my slide was that following the Melnick and Wagner cases, there were a number of other individuals who tried to um, make similar public appeals and their stories really didn't get picked up on by the media with near as much prominence or attention. So I think that there is a point of media saturation and probably uh, a limited sustained public interest in stories of this uh, type. So I'm not quite sure how that would work. And if we did have some sort of natural national platform for that, whether that would be sort of similar to the matchingdonors.com website, which can be uh, a bit problematic for, for some other reasons. Um, but I think people who are in that situation who really need an organ will probably innovate. And uh, we see that with the TikTok and with new social media platforms and new ways of people making these appeals, I think, to try and differentiate themselves and, and get that kind of attention. So I'm not sure in practice um, how that, that might work, but it, it might be an idea to consider. I see also Dr. Muxi has raised his hand. Um, thank you. Uh, because equity or inequity was mentioned, so I felt that uh, I would uh, probably try to pitch in uh, there as well. So uh, as the first slide or the title side uh, slide of my presentation indicated, equity is not the same as equality. So creating a national platform uh, would try to create an equal playing field, so to speak, but equity means more. And uh, this also, uh, Jed mentioned that uh, societies can be assessed by how they treat uh, their most vulnerable uh, individuals or populations. So uh, it is important to emphasize that uh, in access to or in, in supporting communities in accessing uh, kidney transplant, living donor transplant, certain communities may need more support uh, than others. So more, uh, more help will just get them where others are already. So that is important to, to emphasize. And, and I think this is, this is quite uh, the case for ACB communities, but probably for other racialized and marginalized communities uh, by, by other factors than race or ethnicity as well. And I think it is in, in important to somehow balance this by this fairness uh, kind of a perception or unfairness perception of some people getting more support than others. Uh, because uh, they might need more support to achieve the same goals and same outcomes. Thank you.